Hi guys, Assalamualaikum. Today we are going to discuss about document analysis in digital forensic. But before that, let me introduce our friends. Hello, I'm B3. Hi, I'm Kat Nat. And I'm Aini. You guys just listen, okay? No play play. Okay, let's start. In this video, we are going to explain about document analysis. Here is the content and subtopic for document analysis. Before that, we have separate tasks for explanation. First subtopic is the introduction of document analysis that conducted by Siti Nazira. In this subtopic, the introduction will explain in general terms that related to our daily activity. Second explanation subtopic is the relation between document and digital forensics that conducted by Nufitri. In this subtopic, she will explain what is the forensic in document analysis and she will give some explanation to you guys understand more clearly. Third subtopic, we conducted by Nur Aini. She will explain about the metadata in digital forensic. Next, we will continue by Siti Nazira again to explain more about the mining the temporary files and identifying alternate hiding place data. Fifth, how the document analysis is performed? In this subtopic, we'll explain several questions like who is conducted the document analysis, what the tool are using to read analysis, and also we provide some videos that relate on how the process it is. And lastly, the conclusion of document analysis and digital forensic. What is document analysis? In general, document analysis is a form of qualitative research in which documents are interpreted by the researcher to give voice and meaning around an assessment topic. Document analysis is a very common method of collecting data. We may be able to compile and monitoring information and other source information through analysis. So the source of information can be qualitative or qualitative depends on the source. This, there are type of document that can be used as a source. The source of information can be quantitative or qualitative. Uh, the type of document can be written document, photograph, poster, map, database, video, and audio recording. Now I'm going to talk about the relational between document analysis and digital forensics. Generally, social research method and importance is tool in its own right in order to see convergence and corroborating qualitative research usually use at least two resources using different data source and methods corroborating findings across data set can reduce the impact of potential bias by examining information collected through different methods. Next is file is the key or important evidence. They aren't always what they appear to be. Um, they also can be a metadata that can hold clues. Metadata is a data that provide information about another data. Another is it can be hidden in very strange place. And next is it can be attached to the others with alternate data streams. Speaking about alternate data streams or ADS is 
it is a ability of an NTFS file system that usually found in Windows 10. It can store different stream of data by attaching the ADS to any file. File also can be identified in three ways, which is file extension, file headers, and magic numbers. File extension is control behavior of file. Generally, it identifies the type, but can be easily changed. Second is file headers. It's used by application to identify type of files such as PDF or docs is not easily changed but it's not possible and lastly is magic numbers which always uh, can be found in Linux or Unix magic numbers is a number that embedded at or near the beginning of a file that indicates is the file format or type of the file. It's also called as file signatures. It's usually not visible to other users. Guys, okay, right now I'm going to explain to you about the metadata. Let's go. Okay, do you know what is metadata? Okay, let me explain to you. Metadata is often described as the data about the data and used to provide the information about the specific file or document. Computer forensic experts use the metadata to understand what the activity are experiencing, transparent on the digital uh, device like uh, tablets, phones, or computer. Most of metadata fields are hidden and not easy to be accessed or seen by the end user. Sometimes individuals make the effort to alter the purge or to purge metadata. When the person to try to cover his or her track by the tampering with the metadata, inconsistencies across various metadata points can be sometimes reveal clues or evidence tampering on the disruptions of crucial discovery. Only the expert skill in the forensic examinations has a necessary skill and experience to testify the credibility, credibility uh, in a court law about the computer evidence tampering. It's important that you retire, retain a skill and experience, uh, experience forensic expert to preserve the metadata through the forensics imaging or another industry accept the forensic method and perform the necessary metadata analysis for your matter. Hi guys, okay, after I figure out the example of metadata, I like it a lot. But today I'm going to explain to you on four. One is the MF attributes, two is the file header information, three is the end of the file maker, which is no like EOF. The last one is magic number, like my friends talked earlier. Okay? MF is stand for the master file table. is the database in which information about every files and directory on the NT file system stand by NTFS volume is stored. You guys might wondering, what is NT? FS. Okay, the MTFS is the file system views each file as a set of the file attributes. 
elements such as the file's name, its security information, and even its data are all file attributes. Each attribute is defined by an attribute type of code and optionally an attribute name that tell the operating system OS how it deal with the file or directory associated with the record. They are acting uh, identi identifiable attributes plus the user identifiable attributes. Only the few are usable to the navigator, like a file name, attribute, object ID, and the data attribute. MTF record does not go away when a file is deleted. File information is content a string that identifies the file type. The human reliable file has a human reliable identifier. Binary file have a binary identifier, but these are rules of thumb and not enforcers. Provide the starting point of the data carving the ut utilities. Next, we go to the end of use, uh, end of file picker. It's a short of the end of file EOF. is a code placed by the computer after the file byte of a byte. EOF mark are helpful in data transmission and storage. File are stored in the block, and the end U, at the end marker helps the computer knows it has allocated enough space to store the file and last one is they have a full type of metadata one is file system metadata two is substantive metadata three is embedded metadata and last one is external metadata file, uh, file system metadata is to tell the file system how to find the file Provide the, identify, uh, provide the identifying information for each file. Third is the security application use the metadata to managing the permissions. And last one is the uh, modify, access, create data is, um, is uh, maintained by the file system. What is the make data? Make data is not always an accurate measure. Create dates only show when a file appear on the system and not when it was originally created. Copying a file to the system modify the create date. Many utilities can be modified to modify the create date. Any change to the file resets the modified date. Virtually any action will uh, modify the access date. Next is substantive and the embed metadata. Substantive metadata, known as the application's metadata, is created as a function to application software used to create the document or file and reflect substantive change made by the user. Substantive metadata is the embedded in the documents it describes and reminds with the documents when it moves or copy. Embed substance uh, metadata mainly have a different make data than the, the system metadata. Not all of this information is available to the user. And the last one is external metadata. External metadata is metadata which can be applied to the document in any collection types without actually modifying the page in any way. For example, it's possible to make uh, all the pages in the particular website much match the query churn commonly by adding a single line to the external metadata file. Hi, so now I'm going to talk about temporary files. The parent file is, is a file created 
to hold information temporarily while a file is being created. This file holds sensitive function that keep one or more copies of information, save copies of crashed files, and raw data can be get from the spooler when using printer. After the program is closed, the temporary file should be deleted. However, auto save or scratch files is if deleted can be recoverable if not overwritten. Therefore, it can help to recover the data. Don't worry, in forensic, nothing impossible. We can identify alternate hiding place of data from first, the registry, second, document metadata, third, but bad cluster, fourth, alternate data stream, and five, unlocated space. The first way to find hiding data is in the registry. During the usage of software or the hardware, the changes made to this configuration are updated in the registry. In addition, the changes made to control panels, file association, window components, and so on during the use of the computer also updated in the registry. At the register key, using several key, we can store long string variable. Using a key up to 60,383 characters, it can be stored. This is about 6 pages of unformatted text and multiple entries can be used to hold a single file. Next is in, is in the document metadata. Document metadata is a metadata stored inside a document that provides information about the authorship, editing time, and even the computer on which the document was created. Document metadata is basically attribute information stored within Office document. When a Microsoft Word or PDF document is created, it is automatically tagged with some metadata without the author really even knowing about it. This information can be retrieved by anybody who has the document. In Microsoft Word, several pages of text can be also be stored or hide in the command field. Most applications such as iTunes allow string variables in metadata fields. The third one is bad cluster. The term bad cluster and bad sector refer to a specification section of a digital storage device that has been rendered unusable for reading and writing data. When a computer says it has found a bad sector or cluster, it means that it has identified part of connected storage medium that it can access. The computer can attempt to recover data that store on bad sector and cluster, but there's a chance the data is lost forever. NTFS use the bad cluster metafile to list cluster market as bad generally obsolete technology. So if there are bad cluster, you should examine them. We can also find hiding data in the alternate data stream. Alternate data stream or ADS is the ability of an NTFS file system to store different stream of data in addition to the default system which is normally used for a file. The NTFS file contains file with attributes. The relevant attribute, attribute for our scope is the data attribute which is used to store the data stream of a file. Files are linked to a valid host file through the stream of command. Therefore, by using stream utility, all stream files can be found.
finally, hiding data also can be found at the unlocated space in Windows. Unlocated space is the unused space on the hard disk which has not been partitioned or into a volume or drive. That space is not listed under the drive on the PC. Conversely, allocated space is the area on the hard drive where files already reside. No program can write to the space. For all particular purpose, the space doesn't exist to the operating system. Utilities such as slackers can take unlocated and slack space and create a hidden volume in which data can be stored. The space still is mapped into the value and a volume with a large discrepancy between reported space and available space can be suspected. The analysis should be performed by qualified forensic document examiner, preferably one who is the member of the well-established professional associations such as the American Board of Forensic Document Examiner, ABFTE, or the American Society of the Question Document Examiner, ASQDE. Membership requirement for these associations vary. However, an examiner typically must have the completed a two-year full-time training program under the guidance of the Qualified Forensic Document Examiner to maintain the membership in the good standing and keep their skin current. Examiners are required to complete continue education. So let's have a look at the PNG uh, format uh, for its basic header. And what we see as the starting byte for a PNG file is this 89504047 sequence. Then we see another few characters such as the the cars the cars return line feed character that we would often see in files. We have an end of file character there and then another one which is the line feed and this is really there to detect uh, DOS to Unix type conversions. So that's the basic format of the header. So let's have a look at a practical example of this from the site. Okay, so we've loaded up our file here and we can see here there's the, there's the PNG letters there. The starting byte is 8, 9 and hex and then we have PNG and then we have these extra characters there. So we can easily detect that this is a PNG just by looking at the start of the, the file. This is the rest of the contents of the file here and you can try other file formats. Some of the tools that we use as document examiners. There's a digital microscope that we use. This is an example of one. This is from a company called Zarbico in uh, New Jersey. It's called MyScope. It's a very high-end digital microscope. It has a lot of capabilities. It allows us to, to uh, hold that over a document and capture the image right on the computer. Some of the images that I'll be showing to you I captured using that my, my scope. We, ha we use optical microscopes. These are what you might call a standard microscope. On here, it has a boom, what's called a boom arm. And the boom, what the boom arm does is it allows us to hold the, le the lens or the eyepiece over the document rather than close, so it gives, gives a better view. We have what are called IR and UV scopes to allow us to use ultraviolet light and infrared light to look at a document. We have just a little loop. Many of you who have done photography 
or other type of examinations where you need to be able to look at things closely. You may be familiar with a loop, which magnifies 10, 15, 20 times. There's what's called a NIST, National, In National Institutes for Standards and Technology, is what NIST stands for. They, they set up what all of our, uh, how, how, what, what is a meter, what's, a, what's an inch, and so on. And there are standard rulers that, that are graded down to 1 64th of an inch. We use those in order to measure our writing, we, so we can do comparative analysis. Photoshop. Adobe Photoshop is one of the most powerful tools that we use. I'll be showing you some images where I called up, we I shot the image using a MyScope microscope that saves it to the computer. Then I call it up in Adobe Photoshop. And in Adobe Photoshop, you can enlarge the image, you can change the color, you can take one signature and overlay it on top of another signature. So you can see our, how similar they are. It's very, very powerful software. A computer, well, obviously we use computers. We use computers for Adobe Photoshop. We use computers for a whole host of different things. Uh, we use it for writing our invoices. We write it for writing, use it for writing our reports. Um, we use a flatbed scanner. And the way, one of the reasons we use a flatbed scanner is that we want to be able to take the document and store it into the computer and then be able to bring it into Photoshop and, and manipulate it, clip out the signatures, or what we call crop out the signature. We want to be able to change the color. We want to do a lot of things to the document without destroying it. So when we store the image on a flat, using a flatbed scanner, it captures that, and then we can bring it into the computer and play with it and even mess it up. And if you mess it up, you throw it away and scan it again. You, there's no harm done to the original document. This thing called ESDA, Electrostatic Detection Apparatus. It's used for what's called indented writing. So that you can see what one of the things we look for is, if, let's say you write on a pad. When you write on a pad, it puts an impression on the page below it. One of the things that document examiners will sometimes do is get a copy of that pad and then look at the, the indentations on the page below that will tell them what was really written there. Or was there something else written and the page torn off? It's used for collecting evidence. They're very expensive. They cost, I think the base price is around $7,000 and they go up to like 20 or more. And then the VSC. But the, v, the VSC is looking for, uh, looking at the documents using ultraviolet and infrared light. Both of these devices uh, are made by a company called Foster Freeman. They're a British company. They're exceedingly powerful. Uh, at the National Association of Document Examiners Conference this year in Montreal in May, there's going to be a seminar on how to use both of these devices, the, the ESDA and the VSC. It's Visual Spectral Comparator. That's what the VSC is. Used a fair amount. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of research being done with with the uh, with the ESA. One of the more complex uh, problems to solve in document examination is to determine if you have lines crossing each other, which one was written first. It's a very complex problem. There's a lot of literature on it. The ESDA can be used to help solve that problem, so can the VSC. There, and interestingly enough, if you have, if you have a, something that's written and you have a signature, say, that's written and part of the signature goes over the original writing, the question is, which came first? Did someone take the signature and then write something to make it look like that person wrote it? Or did the person write it and, this, and put a signature on there? So there's a lot of a question that comes into play, and it's not a very easy situation to solve or problem to solve. I've even put together some some samples where I know the the, the the sequence of the writing that pen A was used before pen B, and you look at it under the microscope and it looks like pen B was used before pen A. 
because of the type of inks that were used. In conclusion, digital forensic is important. The procedures are important to follow because doing so ensure evidence will be evicted and the suspect will be more likely to face the consciences if found guilty. Following this procedure are means using the proper forensic tool to analyze data correctly. The tools you depend on what is being analyzed. Smaller companies or an individual user may not need any resources to secure their computer but perhaps a big organization might need many different types of applications to monitor hundreds of computers and dozens of sub-networks. This might require a digital evidence bag for more efficient. Digital Forensic Procedures tools and digital evidence bag 15 collections of data also the certain technologies would be benefit from digital evidence bags such as magnetic card reader to the specific program associated with the device to operate the process information that's it for us thank you